Mary Berry was a lady with a vision to help children. So she began a school for poor children. She had no books, she had no buildings, she had no money, but she did have a dream. And so she went to Henry Ford to ask him for a donation. And Mr. Ford reached in his pocket and he pulled out a dime and he handed it to her. Now most people would have been insulted by that. Henry Ford was a multi-millionaire. He could have given millions upon millions had he wanted to. And all he could give or did choose to give was this thin dime. But Martha took that dime and she, uh, she pocketed, uh, she took that money and she bought some packets of seeds. And she planted those seeds and she grew a garden and she raised a crop. And she sold the crop, and she did that over and over again, using seeds from the crops to plant more gardens. And over the course of several harvests, she raised enough money to purchase an old building for her school. And then she returned to Mr. Ford, and she said, look what your dime has done. Henry Ford was so impressed that he donated a million dollars to Martha Berry's school. See, the question isn't, how much do I have? The question is, what am I doing with what God has given to me? I want you to turn in your Bibles with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Matthew chapter 14, verses 25, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. It's a very familiar passage uh, for most of us, parable of the talents, but let's read it once again. It says this, again, it will be like a man going on a, on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with two bags of gold. I See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathered, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your, your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I do, have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned... I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable is about the stewarding of resources that God has entrusted to us. And today we're asking, what are we doing with our time and our talents? Next week we'll be looking at what does it mean to steward our financial resources. You know, there are 24 hours, or 1,440 minutes, or 86,400 seconds in every day. The question is, what in the world are you doing with them, for heaven's sake? See, we, we never have enough time. You know, you talk to people all the time and, and their response is, I'm busy, <laughs> right? How you doing? It's not good or bad or, no, I'm busy, right? We're always doing stuff and we never seem to have enough time. 
And yet we see at times that we're so indiscriminate with the time that we do have, aren't we? And we just give it away, just doing, flitting it away, doing this and that and the other thing. Someone once said, time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. And once it's gone, you can never get it back. There are several passages, several references in this passage to time or time management. In verse 14, it says the man was going on a journey. The master was going on a journey. He had a plan. He had an agenda. He was, he was going on a trip. He had stuff to do. When we talk about our time, most of us have plans for how to live all the moments that we have, right? Right? Whether it's written down or not, most of us have an idea of what we want to do um, and, and what we see happening in the next few days, right? The week, in, the, in the weeks and the months to come. For example, how many of you have plans for this afternoon? Right, see, I see hands. How many of you going Christmas shopping this afternoon? Some of you doing that, right? So some of you Christmas decorating probably, those kinds of things, maybe making some Christmas cookies, right? How many of you have planned a vacation for next summer? No hands. There were all sorts of hands, the first one. Oh, there's a few hands out there. Okay, good. You know, we, we make our plans, right? We look forward to things. But listen to what Jesus, or excuse me, what, what James has to say uh, to us about making our plans. He says this, he says, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are but a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say this, if the Lord is willing, we will live and, and do this or that as it is. You boast in your proud intentions, and all such boasting is evil. Now, what's important to understand here is that it's more than just boasting that's evil. It's living our lives apart from God. It's living our lives apart from His agenda that's evil. Why? Because your time is not your time. Your time is not your time. It's His time that's been entrusted to you. God wants His agenda to be your agenda. You know, we try, to, we try to get away from that by segmenting our life, don't we? I mean, we, we talk about the, the sacred and the secular. And the sacred is over here on this side, and it's the time that I invest in church and, and church activities and those kinds of things. And then the rest of it is my time. It's the secular stuff. It's my time. It's, it's, it's what I want to do. But the truth is, you really only have one life. And it all belongs to God. So here's the question regarding our time. Is God's mission the primary consideration in your planning? What's his place in setting the agenda for your life? See, God is concerned about our stewardship of his resources. Did you catch that? Our stewardship of his resources. And for most of us, most of us that requires a, a change in our mindset because most of us consider our resources to be our resources. And that's why people get resentful when the pastor talks about stewardship. See, we believe it's our money and our time, and our talent. And we resent anyone, even God, telling us how to use it. And that's why we're warned in Scripture, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need a new mindset. The pattern of this world is that it's my life, and I get to do with my life what I want to do with my life, and nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do with my talents. Nobody's going to tell me what to do with my treasures. Nobody's going to tell me what to do with my time. But if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the Bible says you are not your own. You were bought with a price. In other words, your life belongs to God. So the master entrusts his servants with talents. And when we hear the word talent, we immediately think of our natural abilities. You know, uh, some of you have an aptitude for uh, playing music. Uh, some of you don't. Um, you know, some of you have an aptitude for working with wood, and, and some of us don't. 
Now, some of us can, uh, can decorate. By the way, does this look cool or what? Huh? That's a, that's, a, that's a group of talented people that came in and, and, and hooked this all up. And you know what I like about it? I know these are pallets, and I know that, that what you usually do with pallets is throw them away, right, or burn them or something. But God is in the business of redeeming things. And, and I like just the, the symbolism of this, right? That God is in the business of redeeming, even old pallets. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I lost my place in my train of thought. Um, the master entrusts his servants with talents. And we typically think of our, our natural gifts and abilities when we think about those things. But let's go back to the passage and honor what the passage says here. See, the, the Hebrew term for talent was kikar, which means a gold or silver disc. In the Greek language, the word comes from talantin, a large monetary measurement equal to 6,000 drachma, which was the Greek silver coin. And the talent was also the heaviest biblical unit of measurement for weight, and it was equal to 75 pounds. Now imagine the weight of the enemy king's crown when it was placed on David's head because in 2 Samuel it tells us that David took the crown from their king's head. This was his enemy king. Took the crown when, he, when they were conquered. Took the crown from the king's head and it was placed on his own head and it weighed a talent of gold and it was set with precious stones. Can you imagine walking around with a 75 pound crown? That's crazy, Right? I mean, a 75-pound crown gives new meaning to the quote from Shakespeare, heavy is the head that wears the crown. I mean, like, no kidding, right? Revelation chapter 16, 21 says um, that great hailstones fell from heaven uh, and each of them weighed a talent. Now, we get a better picture of this, this crushing fierceness of God's wrath when we realize that these, these hailstones were as big as basketballs and weighed 75 pounds. We're not talking these, you know, teeny tiny golf ball size hail that we all get worried about, right? You imagine trying to duck out of the way of 75 pound hail balls? That's, again, that's crazy. In the New Testament, a talent though was a large sum of money. According to uh, Nave's topical Bible, one who had five talents of gold or silver was a millionaire by today's standards. Some calculate the talent in the parables to be the equivalent of 20 years worth of wages. One scholar estimates the New Testament talent to be around $30,000 today. So there's, there's some, some differing ideas about this, but let me, let me just say, you know, like you're thinking, well, it was a million dollars, or is it a million dollars or is it $30,000? How many of you have $30,000 just laying around doing nothing? Anybody? Okay, so whether it's a million dollars or $30,000, $30, we're still talking a lot of money, right? $30,000 is a lot of money to most people. So here's a, a few things that we need to take from this story. Number one, God will always give us everything that we need to do for what he wants us to do. You know, he always supplies the need for us. If he asks us to do something, he will give us exactly what we need to accomplish that. What did the master want done with his money? Well, the first two servants seemed to understand that the master wanted them to invest and, and, and multiply the talents. They, they sort of grasped the, the, sir, the master's heart because later we learned that the master was pleased with what they did with what they were given. I think the third servant understood this as well, but he was afraid to risk investing what he'd been entrusted with. And so he buried his talent and the master was not pleased. Now there's a truth that we need to understand uh, regarding investing. And that truth is, uh, is as true today as it was then. The, the greater the potential on the return, the greater the risk that's involved as well. And the question of what does the master expect us to do uh, with what, he, what he's given us, I mean, that's a huge question, isn't it? What does he expect us to do with our time? What does he expect us to do with our talent? What does he expect me to do with my life? And it also has major implications for us as a congregation, as a church. What does he expect us to do 
as his church. Well, the church is a gift from God, and its ministry is something that, that you and I have been entrusted with. And therefore, we, when we think about that huge responsibility, one of our thoughts is, well, we better protect that, right? We better protect that. We better protect it from, um, from, from worldly influences. We better protect it from, from those that don't hold biblical values. Some congregations even want to protect it from their pastors who have dreams and visions for, for growing the church and, 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 and changing things up and, and becoming something uh, different than what they've all, all, always been. And, and, and that sort of change makes them nervous, right, and uncomfortable. And it's, a, it's really tempting for congregations to sort of develop a, a fortress mentality, to sort of circle the wagons and, and, and just develop this, this idea that, um, you know, we just need to protect ourselves. Let's keep everything the same and let's keep all these influences from coming in at, at us and, and, and we'll just maintain the status quo. We'll avoid risks and we'll play it safe. But most church growth experts will tell you that a fortress mentality in the church and an aversion to taking risks for the sake of growth indicates that the church is on the downside of its life cycle and that it's in the declining years of its effectiveness. You see, the master wants us to multiply what he's entrusted to us. So how do we do that? How do we multiply the church Usually the answer to that question centers around like developing new programs and having new strategies and methods. But I believe the answer is right in front of me. See, I believe that the answer is in you and 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 you. See, because it's about you investing the time and the talents that have been entrusted to you to expand his kingdom. Listen, listen carefully. You know, sometimes we have this scarcity mentality in the church and we look around and say, I sure wish we could do this, but we just don't have the resources to do that. I sure wish we could pull this off, but I don't see how we could ever do that without the resources. Let me back you up, right? Because what did we say earlier? God has given us everything we need already to accomplish what he wants us to do for his church and for his ministry. We have everything that we need. We have everything we need to reach lost people and to see them grow in a relationship with Christ. But too often, we're holding on to the resources that we've been entrusted with and we aren't willing to invest them for the master. I heard about a pastor who was in the middle of a capital fundraising campaign for a new uh, ministry facility, and the money wasn't coming in like the pastor had hoped. So he got up one Sunday and he said, I have some good news and some bad news, and the good news is this, we have all the money we need to build the building. And everybody cheered, woohoo! And then he went, the bad news is it's still in your pocket. Right? We already have everything we need to grow. We already have everything we need to reach the lost and to make a difference in Roanoke. But we need you to invest the time and the talents that you have been entrusted with in order to expand and multiply this ministry. And the question is, will you take the risk? Will you take the risk? Will you move out of the relative safety of just attending church and risk being the church out there you know, risk being the church in your home with your family, in your neighborhood where you live, in the office where you work, in your school, or on your soccer or basketball team. God has given each of us what we need to do what he wants us to do in order to accomplish the mission that he's called us to. But we also need to understand this. We are not all equally gifted. I'm not saying that God loves some more than others. I'm not saying that anyone is more valuable than anyone else. What I am saying is this. We, like the servants in the parable, are not equally gifted. Look at the parable again. 
To one, the master gave five talents. To another, two talents. And the last guy got one talent. Make no mistake. If you are a servant of the master, you have been gifted. Say that with me. I am gifted. You believe that? That doesn't see, we say that sometimes and, and it doesn't sound like we really believe that. And I run into an awful lot of people that, that I know don't believe that. But if you are a child of the king, then he has gifted you, so you are gifted. So say it like you believe it. I am gifted. There you go. There you go. You're gifted. But we don't all have the same quantity or quality of gift. The parable tells us that the master apportioned the gift, each according to his ability. There's a guy that, that I have admired for a long time, a preacher named John Ortberg. Um, John Ortberg, in my mind, um, man, he's probably the number one preacher that I've ever listened to. I, I just love listening to him. I, can, I could listen to him for hours preach because he's just an amazing communicator. And I remember listening to him one day, and he was actually preaching on this particular passage of Scripture, and he got to this, this idea that we're not all equally gifted. And he said, you know, um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, how talented I am. He says, I'm, I'm, I, I'm maybe, a, maybe I'm a, a two-talent guy, one talent. I don't know. But he says, I know this. He says, I'm good for about 12 good messages a year. And I went, crap. Now, I know you shouldn't say crap in church, but that's what I thought at that moment. You know, because I thought, man, if this guy, who I think is the most gifted communicator out there, thinks he's good for 12 good messages a year, what do you guys get to put up with? Right? We're not all equally gifted. There are some that are better than others. And we need to accept that. I had to come to grips with the fact that I'm probably a one-talent guy in comparison to most of the others. But here's the thing. We're not supposed to compare ourselves either. <laughs> We're just supposed to be faithful of what he's given us. We're not all equally gifted. We won't all have equal amounts of time to invest all our gifts. Now, it's true that we all have 24 hours in a day, but we won't all have the same number of days to work for the master, will we? Some of God's servants here at EWC were called home this past year. Some of you may live to be 100. Who knows? But Psalm 90 says this, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. See, there needs to be a sense of urgency in our stewarding of our talents. When we begin to recognize that this life passes quickly and that there is this this limited window of opportunity that is available for us, it births an urgency in us. And the Bible says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. We all have been gifted. We've all got gifts but not all are gifted equally because we all have different roles to play in accomplishing the mission to reach the world for Christ. And we have a limited time to do it. When we start about talking about like understanding what God's will is, you know, people wonder about that. Oh, I need to find out what God's will is. No, you don't. It's right here. It's black and white. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 gives us a, a clear understanding of what God's will is. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. See, our personal role in that, our personal role in accomplishing God's mission in the world, that's unique. We, we, we all play a different role. Pastor Art has a quote in his office that says, your greatest contribution to the kingdom may not be something you do, but someone you raise and influence. And it's a reminder to him to lead his family well, but it's also a reminder to invest himself in the lives of our teenagers. Others are drawn to people they don't even know. You know, they're, they're, they're drawn to the hurting and the poor, the disenfranchised, the, the marginalized uh, people of the world. Melissa Fisher has traveled to, to Africa several times to minister to the least of these. 
The Preston Park kids and their families have a hold on my heart. I long for them to know Jesus. I want those snack packs that we do every week. I want them to be the gospel in a paper sack. (laughs) That's my prayer. And if they never come through the doors of this church, our snack pack ministry will be a success if somehow those snack packs remind them that Jesus loves them. Janet Guthrie has a heart for women to know Jesus and to grow deeper in their faith. Refresh her is, is part of that ministry of it and part of that mission. Chris and Jacqueline Wallace are investing uh, their, their time and their talents leading a thriving small group. Bill Overstreet is a member of the Gideons and spends hours each year placing Bibles in hotel rooms and, and handing out copies of the gospel on Virginia Tech's campus. Let me tell you about something that happened just this week. This is an amazing story, and I love it. I love it. You all know Tony Struzieri. Tony, you know, in my estimation, Tony's one of those five talent guys, especially when it comes to to handyman stuff. And and he has his own business, and he does that, and and he helps uh, keep this this church ship-shape, right? Um, He's spending hours here um, making sure that... uh, we're taking good care of the building that God has entrusted to us. Tony does a lot of stuff just to keep uh, the church rolling, but um, what you, but many of you don't know is another role that he plays in the mission of God in this world. Uh, Tony's been the caretaker uh, for a, a man named Peter Via, very wealthy individual with a very bad attitude uh, from everything that I can... I never met the guy, but I've heard, I've heard Tony's stories. And uh, Tony has, in, has invested himself um, not just to care for Peter's physical needs, uh, but to make sure that uh, he, every time he had the opportunity, would share Jesus with, with Peter. And Peter was kind of a, a crusty old guy that, that had no use for God, had no use for church, had no use for Jesus. And um, over the last several months, Peter has been going downhill physically. And this week, um, Tony had a, a, an interesting opportunity uh, that God opened up for him. So, Tony, come and share with us uh, what, what happened uh, this week with your connection with Mr. Via. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, Mr. Via had a, uh, he, he lived on an island here in Roanoke. And few folks got to uh, visit him on that island. Uh, He was in control of everything until the Lord laid him down on his back. And um, he then uh, gave me the opportunity uh, humbly to go forward and and, uh, uh, lead him to the Lord. And it was such a privilege. Um, He resisted at first but uh, the Holy Spirit made me power through that. And uh, the the results were that he had not eaten, he had not had anything to drink, he had not spoken in four days, and yet the night before, um, he kept calling out for Tony. Tony, and uh, the the nurse, overnight nurse, uh, texted me and I said, uh, well, you know, call hospice, Let's get some more morphine in him. And uh, I arrived the next morning, and the same thing, Tony, Tony. And um, I had to call hospice, and again, we had to administer some more morphine because he was very, very agitated. Well, um, myself and another uh, Christ follower who was uh, also a caregiver, we waited in the the room, uh, the kitchen, just adjacent to where he was, and um, he kept calling again, Tony, Tony. And I thought, oh, he just, you know, wants, wants to get the keys to his car or, or, or go somewhere. And I, I hesitated for a moment. And then the Holy Spirit controlled my legs and my whole body and took me to his bedside. And I grasped his hand and I looked him in the eyes and I said to him, Peter, You've got to make this right with the Lord today, right now, right here. And he was reluctant, 
and uh, I, I told him that, uh, um, what about this? What if you're wrong about this, Peter? You only have one last opportunity to get this right. And I think that was a tipping point for him where he allowed me to walk him through uh, the prayer of salvation. And for a man who did not speak for four days, he affirmed every phrase of the prayer of salvation. And we were just 12, our eyes are locked. Um, Ross, care, the caregiver, had his left hand. I had his right hand. And um, I, can, I can say that he, he fully understood what he was saying. I asked him, do you understand what this is all about now? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, well, Peter, you can go now. And at that point, his chest heaved up in a huge inhalation, and he let it out, and closed his eyes. One switch went off here in this earthly, earthly, earthly <laughs> captivity, and another light went on, and he left this earth. And it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, and I was just so honored and humbled, but I just dropped to my knees and proclaimed praise to a loving God. And um, it is something that has projected my faith and, and, and my witness um, to levels that I've never, never even dreamed of. So the second half of the story is, now I must go forward and tell the story over and over again. That's neat. That's good. Thanks, Tony. So, you know, Peter didn't get to enjoy what it means to live with Christ as, as Lord of your life here on this earth, but he does get to enjoy uh, the presence of the Lord today. And um, so, you know, I, I, I admire Tony for sticking with it because there were many times when uh, uh, Tony or when uh, Peter rejected. Uh, the, the plan of salvation that Tony tried to share. And even that morning, um, Peter was a, like, a crusty old man, and you got to understand this. I mean, he, he, he was not that interested. And Peter, when Tony said, you know, Peter, there's a, there's a God who loves you, Peter's first response was BS. BS. And it took a, a, it took a lot of, I mean, it would have been easy for Tony to walk away at that point, right? Say, man, the Lord, I tried. I did my best. Um, but he hung in there and he kept telling him, kept sharing with him uh, the difference that Christ would make in his life for eternity. And so, uh, Tony, I'm proud of you, man. Keep, keep sharing the story. Keep sharing the opportunities that you give to share his story uh, with others, too. Um, you know, we all have different roles to play in reaching the world to Christ, for Christ. So what's your role? What's your role? If you don't know what your role is, then I encourage you to come talk to me. Come talk to Tony. Come talk to, to Pastor Art. And, and uh, let's, let's have a conversation about how you can begin to invest your life, your time and your talents for Christ. Um, third, you need to understand this, and this is why it's, why it's important to come talk to us, because one day we're all going to be held accountable. We're all going to be, the, the Bible says after a long time, the master came back. And there's an, there's an important truth in this parable, and that is that the master is coming back. And sometimes we forget that. I mean, we know it, but it's not really on our radar screen. We don't, we don't think about it very often. It's back in, our, in the backs of our minds somewhere. But it's kind of like when we're Christmas shopping and, and we're having a blast buying gifts for all our friends and family and we're just like swiping the credit card, right? Swing, cha-ching, 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 you know, and it's just racking up this, these, these credit card bills and we're not really thinking about it. We, we know that they're racking up, but we're not thinking about how much it is, right? And then January comes around. And the bill comes due, and we're not prepared. Someday, we will all stand before the master and explain what we did with what he's entrusted to us. And from this parable, it's clear that he doesn't want us to simply live our lives protecting what he's entrusted to us. You know, or hoarding what he's given to us. He wants us to multiply it, to invest it, and to show a return on that investment. And that means taking risks 
with our time and our talent for God and for his kingdom. And if you're so familiar with this, with this parable that you breeze through it, you might miss an important warning here. And that's this. Look at what the one talent guy says to the master when it's his turn to give an account. Verse 24. Then the man who had received the one bag of gold, came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not gathered seed or scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And when the master questioned him, the servant gave some lame excuse. You see, he considered the master unjust and so he distrusted his master. But why did he think that? When you read this story, there's nothing obvious that points to the master being unfair. And yet something was fueling this attitude in the servant. So what was it? We're not told, but, but you don't have to look very far to see at least a possible cause for that. See, being given less talents than the other servants were given could appear to be unfair to a proud heart. Like when I see John Ortberg and Andy Stanley and the Jim Symbolas and the Max Licatos of the world, I realize that I'm surrounded by people who have received more from the master than I have in terms of talent. They write better, they're smarter, they have better stories, they get more done. They're better leaders, more efficient administrators, they're more creative than I am, they're more, they're, they're more effective preachers. And on and on the list goes. And if I'm not careful... I'm tempted to covet the talents that others have and wonder why my master didn't entrust me with more. Now, I don't always recognize that as coveting. The way it typically manifests itself in me is in discouragement and self-pity. Sometimes I, I, I feel like a loser. And to be honest, there are times that I fantasize about disappearing to a quiet cabin in northern Michigan to escape all the pressures. But you know what that is? That is a sinful, talent-bearing fantasy. I think it might be a common temptation for less talented servants. And it's all fueled by pride. All that feeling bad about myself, it's all about me. It's a form of self-worship. Gone is love for my master. Gone is love for anyone else. Gone is the wonder over the grace that I received anything at all from the master. Gone is the realization that even one talent is a huge amount and way more than I deserve. Instead of recognizing that what he was given, he instead focused on how little he had been, had been given compared to the others. In his mind, that meant fewer opportunities and less capacity to distinguish himself, and it tainted his view of the master as hard and unjust. So he buried his talent, and he indulged his own self-pity, his own wickedness, his own slothfulness, his own interests. And I think that's why the master called the one-talent servant wicked and slothful. Pride infects us all. No matter how many talents we have, more talented servants have their own temptation. And the Bible deals with that too. But this parable warns us that talented servants need to be aware of the way that pride can dangerously warp our perspective. And when we see this in ourselves, there are a few ways that we need to respond. The first is to recognize it for what it is, and repent of it. The parable shows us less talented servants the spiritual danger of pride. When we see it, we must repent, and and we are wise if we stay alert to the way that self-pity and discouragement can be Trojan horses for sinful pride. It may feel like we need comfort when in reality what we need is to repent. Repent and recommit ourselves to using the gifts that God has given us for his kingdom. Secondly, trust the master. Our master is not unfair in his apportionment of talents. 
He has wise purposes. And if we know his word, we know that that God's purposes are often far different than our perceptions of them. So we need to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding, right? And in all our ways acknowledge him and he promises to make our paths straight. Trust the master and cultivate contentment with what you've been given. And then finally, be faithful with what you've been given. Be faithful. The five-talent and two-talent servants receive the same commendation from the master. No matter how many talents we receive, our master is looking for faithfulness. He will commend faithfulness with little and reward it with much in the kingdom. Remember this. Your life is not a talent show. Right? This This is not America's Got Talent or the voice, you are part of the body of Christ. And each part needs to do its part for the body to be healthy. Our master does not want us to compare our talents with the talents of others. He apportions our talents as he deems best according to his plan and his purpose. Our focus needs to be on being faithful with what he's given us. He wants you to use your time for his kingdom. He wants you to use your talents for his kingdom. He wants to use your life to make a difference for his kingdom. And one day, we'll stand before him face to face. And I long to hear him say the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And you know what? We get to choose here and now whether we hear those words And I want you to hear them. And that's my mission. That's my role. As your pastor, your shepherd, is to prepare you and equip you and train you to encourage you and to invest your time and the talents that you've been given and to steward those things in the mission of God in this world so that one day you too will stand before the Master and hear him say the words, well done. Well done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are a lot of things that um, distract us from your mission in the world. But Lord, you've equipped each and every one of us with talents and gifts that we need in order to accomplish that mission. So I pray that you would help us to stay focused, not to be distracted by the things of the world, but to be focused on what really matters. And to be in pursuit of that, of that day in which we stand before you and you can look us in the eye and we can hold our head up and look you in the eye and hear you say the words, well done, good and faithful servant, well done. Help us to figure out the gifts that you've given us and the time that you've given us to use that wisely in the investment of multiplying your kingdom and making a difference in the world for Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Have a great week in the Lord.